Today, I'm going to be talking about maintaining Fortran in Python in perpetuity. And these are my co-authors. They are fantastic people who couldn't make it here. So quick introduction. So I'm a doctoral researcher at the Science Institute of the University of Iceland, where I get funding from Rannis in the bottom right, and that's my university. On the right is Quantsite Labs, where I'm also a software engineer, and they fund a lot of my open source work as well. And so the logistics of this is that uh, they'll be on the um, they'll be on the repository as well, and the questions are later, as we know. So because this is um, SciPyCon, I wasn't really sure if I need to start with this, but still, you know, um, a couple of years ago, 15 years before I was born, then it was well understood that if you have an algorithm and you want everyone to use it, then you have to move it between machines sometimes. But of course, you know. Back then, there was skepticism as well. There's no such thing as a machine-independent program. And yet, you would still have to move programs. I mean, clearly, we're here today. And this mostly happened because of automated coding, what we now call compilers, and standards. Because here's something closer to when I was looking into things. The standard is a contract between the compiler writer and the application developer. And what that means is that we get to go from code to the compiler, which will generate assembly. And then we finally get this magic relocatable machine code, and then it gets you know, linked to various other libraries and loaded and finally used. That's well and good, but there's just one problem. You know, standards change. And this is why you know, you'll find a lot of people complaining about Fortran 77, Fortran 66, something or the other. And there are two Fortran jokes on the slide, which I'm going to skip, but uh, maybe many of you will recognize the Python joke, which is that when you move from 2.7, and if people had scripts which look like this, then depending on what they had in them, their code would either crash and burn or it would work fine. And for a lot of people, even today, even last year, I met uh, someone who was telling me, they should have never removed, I mean, why the braces? You know, like, what were they for? So yes, you know, standards change and people don't change as quickly, right? So what happened with Fortran C in Python? Well, Fortran is one of the oldest languages, so and it took them a while to realize that, hey, you know, a lot of Fortran compilers are basically transpilers to C, and let's maybe formalize this a little bit. So in 2003, the committee introduced the ISO C bindings. Then in 2008, they realized they forgot about void star, so they added some more support. And then in 2018, we now have like C descriptors, CFI descriptors, which is great if you're, if you're working with strings. Unfortunately, there's an ABI break there. We can, yeah. We can talk about that later. And interoperability became fairly standardized. You know? So Andre, uh, one of my mentors and friends and colleagues, he has this website, fortran90.org, where the simple thing is you take Fortran code, you write it with types which are ISOC binding, uh, which are compliant with the ISOC bindings, and it just works. You can call it in C with a conforming compiler. And then, of course, you wrap it through to Python using either Cython or CFFI or something else, right? So where does f2pi come into all of this? Like, <clears throat> what is f2pi? OK, so f2pi was developed, and the dates are important because of the timeline. So it was developed in 1999, and it was roughly co-located with like, the development of SciPy itself. And importantly, it was four years before the actual ISOC bindings. So if anyone asks why aren't there ISOC bindings, well, you know, because of time. And then in 2000, there was the second edition. And for a while, there was some development. But then as things happen, you know, not a whole lot. And then in 2007, it was moved wholesale into NumPy. And this is the current state of F2Pi. We are part of NumPy. It was good for F2Pi because, you know, um, maintenance was spotty. And within NumPy, we were updated, you know, to Python 3, lots of stuff. And it is used everywhere. SciPy is our biggest downstream consumer to the point where it's our de facto test suit. Um, but also there are lots of scientific codes like MSpec. It does uh, spectroscopy, if anyone has any interest in that. And let's take a look at the design. So whenever you have code, you need to have a parse tree. You need to have some sort of way of understanding what that code is saying. So we have a sort of best effort crack Fortran sort of like a front-end parser. And then we have these signature files which we create. And either we create a signature file, which, is, uh, which has the .pyf extension, or we can use inline comments. Now, the fun thing is, it's not a compiler. So we are not standards compliant, very happily so. And moreover, we can do things which standards compliant code can't do, like rewrite your code to do something which maybe you didn't ask for. 
it's it's a feature, not a bug, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. So how does it actually work and what does it look like? Okay, so let's suppose, and the screen case is painful, but uh, I think this is the only slide with screen case, so it's gonna be fine. So this is good old Fortran 77. You have your little um, white space in the beginning and you have your interesting declarations. This is actually non-standard, but that's fine. The important thing is usage is two lines. And I didn't want to put any speed or benchmark graphs because those are almost always wrong, but it is way faster than doing the Fibonacci numbers in pure Python. And it is, well, you can, it's also quite as fast if you compare it to NumPy. And what's going on? Well, okay, cool, but something must have happened. We saw that whole thing about code and assembly and linking. So actually all of that does happen. It's just that it's hidden away from the end user. So what really happens, if you want to take a look, is all these files are created. Some of these make intuitive sense. This is clearly the object file from the um, source. Some of these make less intuitive sense, like where did these two come from? This is clearly the wrappers, but okay, there are now two additional files. Great, from somewhere. And if you're thinking maybe they're stubs, maybe they're not important, well, not, not really. So there's quite a lot of stuff in there. Which brings us to the next thing. How do you actually get compiled? How do you actually get to the Python extension? There's NumPy distutils, which has gone the way of the dodo because it's on its way out. It's not gonna be there, but this is still what you'd normally do. You'd use distutils, which would check for all your Fortran compilers and everything else. It was great, you know, it was great when it worked and when it didn't, then good luck. Additionally, it's not fun to always use NumPy distutils, especially in this day and age. You know, we have Mison, we have CMake, we even have like Top and all of these other build systems. Maybe we don't want to use NumPy distutils, also because next year you can't. So now we'll come to the actual maintenance bits. <clears throat> so SciPy made the shift to Mison, Ralph mostly spearheaded that, along with a lot of other contributors. And F2Py now can follow along as well. There are helper functions which make life a lot easier, including the fact that you don't actually need to schlep around the Fortran object.c. You can actually um, run some things and get it out. And it's nice. It works better than having to remember a whole bunch of command line flags or, and or working with setup.py. We also have a GSOC student this year who is working on the CLI because the CLI in F2Py, the way it's implemented, the way it works, it really does two jobs. Okay. When you pass it the C flag, it suddenly becomes a front end to distutils. And then it's trying to compile everything and give you the .so, the extension. And otherwise, it's really meant to just give you the C wrappers and the signature files, which you might want to modify, edit, and then commit to version control. And um, this year under the PSF, which Medul also manages, um, we got a student who is going to be rewriting our front end in argparse, which is nice. And okay, so the elephant in the room is obviously derived types, supported since Fortran 90 and still not exactly there inside F2Py, but we're almost there. So we have, we have a design document, we have specs, we have discussions there. Everyone is more than welcome to come and help out because there are a couple of, there are a couple of language level decisions which we need to make, you know, like what does it look like in Python really? Is it a class? Is it a dictionary? Is it a list, et cetera? Bind C types are of course easiest because they map directly, almost directly onto classes. And you can actually do this today kind of with this uh, repository and that's quite nice. But to move beyond bind C, we need to go back to what I said earlier, which is that since we're not a compiler, we can actually do more than just deal with the code you give us. And F2Py already does this a lot. When you give us Fortran code, we write more Fortran code. So we basically generate all these subroutines which will manipulate derived types which are all allocated, all the memory allocations, everything is done in Fortran. And we just have these very thin handles to that. And it's a good method and it works. The other thing is if you have seen the F2Py directory within NumPy, it is a set of files. It is very not fun to read. And we have a logical restructuring actually, which we'll go through in a second. But really, you know, we have the code gen, which is separate from the actual C sources, which you need for the compilation, which is separate from the front end, which also does type inference. And finally, the standards, you know, how do you support a common block? How do you support module? How do you support uh, these really nice uh, bounds checking additions, which we have inside F2Py? And we have utilities and tests because otherwise we'd all go insane. What does maintenance actually look like? What does it mean to maintain F2Py? Well, it's simple. You find a beach, 
and you read a book. Well, you read a couple of books. Not long. You know, the Fortran standard is all of 600 pages. It's a fun beach read. This is a beach in Iceland. It's very nice. You should visit. And maybe you also need the Python C API. Now 320 pages, maybe the NumPy C API, now the 100 pages. Um, you're still better off than reading the entire C++ standard because that's still coming in at 1800 pages. So it's really not that bad. But of course, you know, the way it actually works is that we'll write a test for every bug reported and we'll walk through the step by step. And it's in a class because we typically will compile this and then we'll, we'll therefore call it like this. So that's why we just encapsulate them into a class which has all these things. And then we can write multiple tests for this. <clears throat> and then suppose you have a bug in the front end. Suppose you want to make a new specification. Say you want to recognize um, operator as a keyword or something like that. The problem is you're going to need an editable install because we have a lot of global variables. Sorry about that, but this is many years ago and we just do. So you need to have breakpoints and you need to just look around at the state of what F2Py knows at that point in time. We'll probably fix that at some point. <clears throat> but for the back end, the back end is where things are a little bit more fun. If anyone wants to work on something, there's the sprint. Actually, if you need to set up GDB with CPython extensions, but it's very rarely required. Um, and actually, what I wanted to show and walk through is an enhancement, which we did recently, a very tiny minor enhancement from the Fortran standard, which is in Fortran, typically everything is passed by reference. Okay? But in 2003, they said, hey, you know, some things, small integers, you, know, you don't really want to store pointers, blah, blah. You just want to call by value. You just want to copy the thing over. And so Fortran 2003 supports call by value. And it's a really nicely reported issue. We can come back and see it. There's a lot of detail there. But the first thing which we'd like to do is we'd like to verify it. And so using the Mison description, it's there in the docs now. There's a, the documentation has improved a lot. We have rewritten almost every page of it over time, and it's quite nice. And there's a simple function which squares two numbers. One of them is actually passed by value, and that's why we get junk data. And if you look at the generated C code, which is another reason why you, it's easier actually to generate the wrappers so that you can modify them iteratively and then, and then recompile them with Mison. So then you, if you take a look at the signature, then you see the problem right here. It's passing two pointers to two integers and it's also passing, you know, it's also calling the function by reference. So you get junk. Okay, so what do you do about this? Well, immediately since you have C code, then you fix it by hand and you check, okay, cool, that worked. Awesome. Now you need to go back to F2Py. You need to go back and sort of figure out where you need to make these changes. So the first thing is you need to check if value is actually recognized by the parser. Is this in the right place? And thankfully, actually, <clears throat> it is. This was because of some other work. So F2Py, at least the crack Fortran portion, is also used by Sphinx Fortran. And so they made a lot of pull requests at some point to uh, recognize, at least in Crack Fortran, a lot of these tokens so that they could do better documentation, even if you know, we don't actually support all the features throughout the entire pipeline. But it helps because in this particular case, we can see that um, you know, value is already recognized in the attribute specification for the variable. Now, the next thing which you need to do is you need to check where actually the signature is being generated. And so you check, okay, so the way F2Py works is everything is a giant dictionary and we just keep nesting the dictionaries arbitrarily and we keep going over them. And essentially we just need to check that, okay, don't make it, don't pass a pointer unless, you know, if it's, if it's not a by value thing, then yeah. So that's it really, well, almost. So then you also need to make sure that when the wrappers are actually generated and this is, so another way of thinking about this is it's sort of proto Jinja as well, because it was again many years before that. And yeah, so we make one last change, add tests, solicit reviews, check if you need a release note, and there you go. It's the lifetime of F2Py maintenance for the most part. There's a lot of other stuff which goes on, you know, like when we need to add more features, when we need to have larger discussions with the community, when we break SciPy, you know, th these are a lot of things which happen, but for the most part, it's still excessively simple to maintain. And there's no reason not to, you know, we get good high quality issues and 
to say that we should move away from F2Py, from Fortran in Python is mostly folly for most cases. <clears throat> so there are, of course, things to do, and we are working on things to do. So we have a new test suite. It's in PRC. It's CMocker. It's fun. Um, also, because we don't generally test a lot of the C code which we generate, but now we will. And we have to do this build tool support, which is tricky because there are a lot of things which distutils does for you, which nobody else will, like give you a list of all the libraries which it thinks are installed and how you would like to link to them. Nobody else does the exact same thing. So, yeah. And also backwards compatibility is a huge problem with F2Py because most people run F2Py and they have never looked at it again. So we need to be very careful all the time. There are a lot of standards out there. We're still partially supporting F90, partially supporting 2003, partially supporting a whole bunch of things, but at least there we're not doing any worse than the compilers. Thank you, G-Fortran. But um, <laughs> there's always more documentation and there are other projects which deal with the representation in the beginning. You know, when we talk about, say, you have Fortran code and then you parse it into a giant dictionary which has like a whole bunch of other nested dictionaries, there are, of course, nicer things to do. And some of those nicer things involve better abstract representations or concepts like which are there in G3 F2Py, which sadly hasn't been developed that much. And there are a lot of nice proposals because the Fortran language and the language committee basically included a whole lot of fun things like do concurrent, which basically gets rid of the requirement to have MPI and sounds like a good thing to have work with the context manager, for example. So these are some of the things which we are thinking about doing. So, I mean, I guess the question is, why does Fortran need to stay in Python anyway? And the answer is really, well, because you want to write efficient wrappers and you don't want to read all those books. You know, maybe you don't have an Icelandic beach to sit on, maybe you don't care. And how does it stay? Well, you know, with everyone's help, you know, you find a bug, file an issue, talk to us, and there are a lot of non-code contributions as well. And that's practically the end of it. So there's some acknowledgments. This is my supervisor. There's Andre, who has been a great help with all things Fortran. People at Ponset Labs, Ralph, Melissa, Piaru, everyone at NumPy, Matty, Ross, Sebastian, Chuck, Ganessa, everyone else, and of course, Family Pets group members, and all of you. Thank you for listening. And I'm very early, but I'm going to stop here. <laughs>